Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to week number 31 of the Wiggy One Get Your Property Questions Answered weekly webinar. Hope you guys are doing really well. Now, it has been a bit of a scorching start to the summer, thankfully. So I'm not going to complain that it's very warm and we're sweltering a little bit here in the office, but I am really pleased to see that we're finally getting some sunshine in England. There is no greater place to be in this country than England when the sun is shining, which I find is a rarity sometimes, but a beautiful place in the world to be and avoiding the expense, of course, to go abroad to catch some summer sun. That aside, I just wanted to spend a, a quick moment or two touching on what's happening in the property market right now. For those of you that are weathering the storm of uncertainty in the property market at the moment, I think it's fairly clear to see that interest rates are moving in one direction and one direction only. And I think we can put paid to the shall we say, misleading advice of certain people in the industry that were suggesting that interest rates would return back down to normality, normal levels of 2 3% before the end of the year. That's definitely not going to happen. And quite frankly, I think interest rates are going to continue to rise. And I'm not saying this to frighten anybody or to scare anybody, but to let you know that we are entering uncharted territory that we certainly haven't been in for many years now. And as I've said on previous editions of this webinar, which I'm sure you guys will have seen in the past, that the market is going to enter a period of, shall we say, stagnation. It's certainly going to start slowing down to what it was in the past. And the days of throw it on the internet and hope that it sells and collect a commission at the end of the day are going to be long gone. So if you're still enjoying a good market, if you're still selling properties well as estate agents, then enjoy those times, embrace those times. But I think what will happen over the course of the next few weeks and months is that the consumer confidence is going to start to peter out of the market. And people are already, not just by handfuls, by scores and hundreds of people commenting in social media forums about the cost of their current mortgages and what they're going to be now. So they've had many years of very low interest rates. And now those interest rates have crept right back up. Mortgage payments have doubled or trebled in some cases. And it's now becoming actually more profitable to hold cash in the bank than it is to put it into an investment property. For people buying a home, they find that they can no longer afford the big mortgage that they once could. And we're now running at an affordability multiple at around about 10 or 11 times, which is absolutely unheard of and completely obscene. So whilst there is some comparison with people saying, oh, in the 80s, interest rates hit 15% and it wasn't too much of a problem, we managed to hold on to our properties. That was a very different multiple of probably three to three and a half times with their salary, whereas now it is significantly different. And that's where I think the consumer confidence will start to dissipate from the marketplace and it will become a lot harder to start selling properties. The reason I'm impressing this point, guys, over the course of the last few webinars that we've done is because it is so important to be moving with the times. And if you're not already, if you're an estate agent or a conveyancer, or a buyer and a seller, and you're not prepared to go into a tough market, you're going to find it very disappointing when things aren't selling. You're going to find it a journey that's fraught with anxiety and frustration because you're going to put your house on the market. You're going to expect it to sell straight away. That's not going to happen. You're going to get pretty fed up with tire kickers coming through the door, but nobody actually making any concrete offers or offers coming in at way below what you thought there would be. And obviously this is not a catch-all. It's not going to apply to every property. The rare breeds that come on the market every so often will always sell and will always sell at a good price. But for most other properties in the marketplace, certainly those that involve a chain, for people to work their way up through that chain to buy bigger and bigger properties, that is going to be the time when things get more and more testing and it's become, going to become harder and harder for people to achieve the price that they want. So we can expect price revisions across the board as a whole. And traditionally, guys, this is what happens when we come to the end of a boom cycle. Unfortunately, everybody still continues to buy into the previous thinking that the property market only goes one way and it always goes up forever and ever. But the reality is that on cycles every seven to 10 years, the property market slows down or stops and then it stagnates for a period of anywhere between 12 months and four years. When that happens in the marketplace, it definitely sorts the wheat from the chaff. It definitely sorts the players out from the A players in the estate agency game and the conveyancing game particularly as well. Like I say, guys, not saying any of this to scare anybody, only sharing this with you because it's my genuine belief that 
the market has already changed and it will continue to get harder. So if you're not prepared for it, then, the, you know, there's only one person to blame is what I'm really trying to say. Look, we're here to support any agent or conveyancer to weather the storm and get through it and to create the very best business that they can create and to serve their clients at the highest possible levels. But unfortunately, if people are going to sit on their hands and just expect everything to get back to normal, that's uh, living on Fantasy Island, I'm afraid. So I wanted to just check in with you guys on that front and let you know what my thoughts are about the market and how things are going to unfold. Bit of a bleak outlook, if I'm honest with you. I don't think appealing to the government's better nature is going to help. I certainly don't think appealing to the Bank of England's better nature is going to help because I think that they probably got less of a clue than anybody else, really. That's my thoughts. And just finally, just to wrap that point up, guys, without laboring for too much longer, I want to share a bit of a story with you, which is in 2008, I was in a room full of property investors. It was a closed door meeting of about 40 or 50 property investors. And I was the youngest in there and the most inexperienced by a long way. And at the time the question was asked, who thinks this is going to be a quick blip in the marketplace and things are going to turn around very quickly and who thinks it's going to be a long drawn out thing. And everybody else in the room, bar me, quite literally put their hands up to say it was going to be a quick flash in the pan thing. It would be over very quickly and the market would continue. And I was the only one that said, actually, I think it's going to be a long drawn out thing. And everybody looked at me as though I was an idiot because I was the youngest and the most inexperienced property investor in the room, but proved out that I was right. And the only reason I can say that I was right was because I listened to my intuition. I looked at what was going on around me. I saw what was happening in the financial markets, which is the biggest indicator. And actually, if you look at the toxic debt that the banks are carrying now, Compared to 2008, it makes 2008 look like a walk in the park. So I'll leave that to your imagination as to what's likely to unfold over the course of the next few years. But anyway, let's not get too carried away with all of that. Let's get on with today's webinar. Moving on to question number one, which has come in here from Barbara. Hi there, Barbara. Thank you for being part of the amazing Wiggy One community and for submitting your question. So Barbara's question is, we've just listed our home for sale and we've had some people interested. We found a property that we think we'd like to move to, but we're worried about the horror stories that come up of sales falling through. What would you say are the most common reasons for property sales to fall apart? And is there any way I can prevent it from happening to us? Okay, there, Barbara, that's a great question. Thank you very much for sending that one in. This is interesting because not only is agreeing a sale going to be harder for a lot of estate agents and conveyances, as I've just alluded to at the start of this webinar. But keeping those sales together is going to be of paramount importance for everybody involved. And I think there's going to be a real opportunity for the best agents to shine by putting themselves out there and by making sure that they are the ones that are really digging in deep and working hard for their clients and getting the best price they can for them. And not just only that, but actually seeing the deal all the way through to completion. Okay. Now, in terms of the reasons why sales fall through, currently we're running at about a one in three scenario where one in every three sales falls apart, which gives you a sort of two thirds, one thirds chance of your deal actually completing. But there are many reasons that, and one of those main reasons will be anything to do with the property itself, i.e. the physical structural condition of the property. Are there repairs that need to be done? Is there maintenance issues that are outstanding? Are there any structural issues that need to be addressed? Are there holes in the roof, missing roof tiles, damaged rainwater goods, all that sort of thing? Because the real problem for many people that come to have a look at your property, they are not necessarily seasoned property buyers. So what they will do is they will go and have a look at the property. They'll decide whether or not it's for them, but they have no clue as to whether or not it's structurally sound. They have no clue whether or not it needs a lot of money spending on it to do it up usually. And so when the surveyor goes around and says it needs 20,000 pounds spending on it, they go, oh my goodness, wasn't expecting that. I'm scared. I'm pulling out of the deal is basically what goes on. Okay. Same sort of thing can happen with legal title issues. Okay. That's why it's important to have a really good conveyance to look at the property before you put it on the open market. And also one of the main reasons why we advocate having seller's packs done on properties up front, because you're collecting a lot more of that legal information early on in the process which then helps to avoid any kind of issues raising their head at a later date, which obviously then becomes far more expensive to resolve. Okay. 
other reasons why a property seller might pull through will become patently obvious as interest rates start to increase, which is buyer's affordability. Okay. So if there's any hiccups in their mortgage application, again, banks will get more and more cautious about lending. They'll start to get more and more cautious about the financing that they're giving to people and the stability of the clients that are taking the finance in the first place. As interest rates start to creep up, they might go, do you know what, actually, you don't pass a stress test anymore. We're not going to give you that mortgage product. Therefore, the sale falls apart. But that, that might not necessarily affect your property that you're selling, Barbara, but it might affect either somebody earlier on in the chain or later on in the chain from you. So remember, this is one of the peculiarities, if you like, of selling property in England and Wales is that we end up with these chain situations, not all the time, but sometimes. And when you're selling property abroad, invariably those situations tend to be more sales to cash buyers, empty properties that can be sold very quickly, very short transaction, buy, sell, job done. Okay. The complications that you will experience, Barbara, as well, is another reason why I highly recommend having a protect your pocket policy in place. It's a cost indemnity insurance policy, which is there to underwrite your cost when it comes to instructing solicitors on the sale of your property and also instructing solicitors on the property that you want to buy. You need one of those policies in place because God forbid, if the deal falls apart, you'll have incurred a lot of expense on surveyors fees, mortgage application fees, solicitors fees, etc. You don't want to be paying that out of your own pocket to then have to pay the same costs again on the property that you're then going to buy because your deal fell apart or your sale fell apart, etc. So you desperately need your protect your pocket policy in place. And then finally, what I would suggest is that you work with competent professionals, such as your estate agent and your solicitor to ensure all of your necessary checks and processes are completed upfront early on in the process. And it becomes a much more seamless transaction all the way through. So I've thrown quite a lot at you there, Barbara. I hope you don't mind me sharing a bit of knowledge and information, but obviously if you want to grab yourself a copy of Home Buyer Secrets, I'm going to suggest that's money well spent, to be honest with you. That will guide you a little bit more through the process than what I can do in a sort of five to 10 minute video here, but definitely get yourself legally prepared, get yourself in the best possible position that you can do with your property in order to be able to take that buyer or take that sale and get it through to completion as quickly as possible, because the longer it goes on for, the higher the likelihood there is of the whole thing falling apart and nobody wants that. Okay, Barbara. So hope that helps you really appreciate you sending the question into us and I'm wishing you all the very best of luck with that. If there's anything else that we can do, then obviously let us know. All right, Barbara, good luck. Question number two comes in here from Amelia. Hi there, Amelia. Thank you for being part of the amazing WiggyWam community and for sending in your question here. So Amelia says, as an estate agent, I'm concerned the market has slowed down significantly. What can I do to help sell my client's properties faster and also increase my commission? That's a great question, Amelia. Very short, sharp, and precise. We can get into that straight away. I think one of the biggest things, Amelia, as this market begins to get tighter, is that it's so important to price properties competitively. Okay. Now this is a beautiful opportunity and some people aren't going to like me saying this, but this is a beautiful opportunity for estate agents to get one over on their competitors that are always overvaluing and underfeeing the jobs. All right. So when they're prepared to do that, you let them carry on doing that because the likelihood is they're going to tie their clients into their 12 week marketing agreement. They're not going to sell the property in that period of time because there's no buyers about at that sort of level of money anymore. They're not going to get them to reduce the price significantly enough to sell it within that 12 week marketing period, which is a usual tactic. And then at the end of that 12 week marketing period, you then step in and you take the property onto your books at a much more competitive price. Okay. Now, why would you want to do that? If you think about it, your competitors took the property on the market. They've spent all that time and effort and energy trying to sell that property. And now they're going to be completely out of pocket when the seller pulls it off the market with them and hands it over to you to start selling for them. So great to kindly get a bit of payback, if you like, to those competitors that have been causing you so many headaches with their overvaluing and underfeeing approach to estate agency over the last few years. Okay. But all joking aside, one of the things I will say is that competitively pricing the properties is crucial. You've got to give your clients the very best advice that you can, which is the market's changed. Prices aren't where they were six or 12 months ago. We recommend that you price it very competitively. 
or under, I use that word in inverted commas, under what the current market value is compared to other properties that are on the market at the same time, because the likelihood is those properties were priced six or 12 months ago when the prices were a lot higher or potentially could have been a lot higher. And now they are overpriced. So when a reasonably competitive property comes on the market, that seems underpriced, that's going to attract some interest. Okay. So that's exactly how I would approach it. The next thing I would do is to make sure that the properties are looking their best. So you want to give the clients the very best advice you can in terms of getting the curb appeal right, in terms of getting the declutter process going throughout their home and to use the professional photography as a value added upfront sale to the client in order to present the property in the best possible light. And whilst we're talking about upfront sales, this is the time when you need to be working as hard as possible to generate as much upfront income as you can into your business through things like sellers packs, through things like twin search or search packs, etc., into your business in order to increase that upfront cash collection to keep the doors open because agents that aren't doing this, that are going on the whole, no win, no fee basis, and that are operating the same as they were 12 months ago are going to find things getting very tough over the course of the next few months. Okay. So that's exactly what I would be doing. Clearly when you've got interest in a property, you need to get those people through the door. You need to get them around, whether that's through virtual tours, which I think they're great. I think they're helpful, but it can't substitute getting somebody across the threshold, especially with the weather that we've got right now. Okay. It's summer weather. Everything always looks its best. Everybody wants to move everywhere where they go on holiday in England when the weather's good. So get people across the threshold is the most important point. And then perhaps even think about running some kind of limited time promotion around the property. And that may be such crazy ideas as saying buy before X to get all fixes and fixings included or all carpets, curtains, a hot tub and the garden shed included. I'm throwing ideas out there, but the point is, what can you do to make your client's property stand out from the crowd and get people across that threshold as soon as possible? Okay, Amelia, hopefully that's answered the question fairly comprehensively in a short amount of time, but you have to focus now on the upfront cash collection. The story that I've shared before, a friend of mine in 2008 was keeping the doors open on his estate agency by doing energy performance certificates at 50 quid a pop because there was no commission coming through the door in terms of property sales. Could that same situation happen again? You absolutely bet it could. And I don't think it's far away, especially if interest rates creep up another notch or two. All right, focus on that cash collection, Amelia. Focus on giving the best value that you can to your clients, and you'll find it not only a way to get some cash up front, overall, your commission will increase, and you'll do a much better job for helping your clients to close on their property deals ASAP. All right, Amelia, so thanks so much indeed for sharing your question with us. And good luck, everything we can do to help, then please let us know. All right, moving on, question number three comes in here from Jenny. Hi there, Jenny. Thank you for being part of the amazing WikiWeb community and for submitting your question to us here. So Jenny says, as the market becomes tougher and sales dry up, what can I do to improve cash flow in an extended sale process? By this, I mean it's going to take far longer to get our commission in the bank, but we're still going to be spending money on marketing our clients' properties we need to know how to keep the lights on as the market grinds to a halt. Okay, Jenny, it's great to see somebody as an agent thinking along similar lines to myself here in terms of where you, what your views are about where the market's going and what I think. And that's not to say that I'm right, as it were, but I really appreciate where you're coming from. And I can totally understand what your thinking is in terms of making sure that you've got upfront revenue coming into your business, okay? And you're not relying upon those no sell, no fee commissions dropping into your bank account at the end of the day. Now, <clears throat> as I alluded to at Amelia's question earlier, earlier on, this is the time for your fees to be going up, not down. And they can only be going up in one of two ways. First of all, by asking for more money. And secondly, by offering to sell your clients more upfront services that will help them with the sale of their property sooner rather than later. Okay. Now, I think that would be a smart thing to do and I would certainly be looking at providing a lot more information up front and providing a much better value added service to your clients by offering to sell them something like a seller's pack. And let me be perfectly frank with any agents that are watching this video right now. 
and I love you guys. I want you to hear this and I want you to get it with the intent and the love that is sitting behind it because I promise you it's there. Okay. Now, in my experience, a lot of estate agents hate the idea of losing the instruction because they've allowed something that's not within their normal sphere of operation to interfere with the sales pitch. And therefore they're afraid that by introducing something new, they're going to lose the instructions to somebody else. And this market is going to change all of that for you. I can promise you. All right. What your clients need now is a very safe pair of hands to guide them through this very difficult market. And a safe pair of hands is not worried about giving the client a little bit of upfront information about their property that they may not want to know about. Okay. They have to know about it. For example, I was just speaking with the guys from AIA, okay? And what they do is they produce information on a property that gives a score about how difficult that property is going to be to get through the legal conveyancing process. Now, to me, as an agent, that would be absolute gold to have. And for the cost of what it is, it's negligible. As an agent, I would be taking that report to the client and sitting down with them and saying, look, I don't know if you're aware of this, but as an expert agent, let me demonstrate to you that there is something maybe on the legal title of this property that we need to address early on. Okay. I.e. now at the point of putting the property up for sale, or at least get a legal opinion on it, because if we don't, then what's going to happen is we're going to find a buyer. We're going to instruct solicitors. The problem's going to raise its head. Your buyer's going to get fed up and pull out of the deal and you're going to be left with nothing. Now, what job would I be doing for my client if I allowed that to happen on my watch when I knew that there was a tool available that could help them? And this is where I say this tougher market is going to separate the men from the boys. It's going to separate the honest from the showman. And I think this is the point that going armed with that information and helping your clients in a way that is truly authentic is the only way, in my humble opinion, to be an estate agent. It's about that transparency. It's about that authenticity. It's not throwing your client under a bus and going, I don't want to know about that right now because, you know what, frankly, it might interfere with the chance of winning the instruction and they'll go with my competitors down the road. Screw that. Surely it's about doing the best job you can for your clients and building your reputation off the back of that, because you've done a very thorough and honest job for your client. Surely that's what it's about, right? There's one estate agent I'm in contact with, and he has a price promise with his agency. And that price promise is, if I don't get you the price that I value the property at, I'm going to sell it for free. All right. And he's not just saying, oh, I'll get you more than a pound. Okay. The guy's not an idiot. <laughs> he's not playing games here. He's saying, I'm coming out to your property. I'm a professional. This is what I believe the property will sell for. If I do not achieve that figure, then I'll sell it for free. And the interesting thing was this estate agent made a very public declaration about that is part of his service guarantee. And then that was shared in one of the social media groups. And the question was asked, how many other agents would be willing to offer something similar? And virtually nobody responded to that post. Now, either they weren't interested in the post, which I think is bizarre, or they were maybe afraid that there's competition out there that would actually offer that and honor that. And maybe it holds a mirror up to people and says, maybe there's a better way of doing things here. And I'm not saying this to say one person's better than the other. What I'm doing is I'm sharing ideas here, guys. And I'm sharing with you the ideas that as a community working together, we have the power to change the property market for the better. We have the power to serve our mutual clients in a way that they would absolutely love and adore and are prepared to pay for. I don't know how I need to emphasize that far more. And they are prepared to pay for it. Surely that should be ringing cash register in the background, right? They're prepared to pay for it because they want a smoother, less stressful, less frustrating, less headachey sales experience because they're selling their most prized asset and possession, right? So I've gone off a bit of a tangent here, Jenny. I don't know why. Maybe the sun's gone to my head today, but hopefully you guys can see that I'm trying to share with you 
these ideas and these ways that we can get creative in the estate agency process to give the very best service that we can to our clients. Okay. I forget where I got to with all, with all of this, Jenny, but as I say, you need to be offering this upfront information to your clients. Okay. Because you've got to get some of the cash into your business up front. What would ordinarily arrive at the back end after a five month sales process, which we've just been used to going through, that might be a five month marketing process before too much longer. So you need to get some cash up front to cover either of those five months. Otherwise it's lights out time. So it's about getting that cash up front, selling them what they need up front. Okay. Now, one of the things that you might decide to think about offering, oh, it's a new suggestion. What about offering payment plans to your clients to cover your fee? So rather than saying it comes out on the back end, it's a big lump. Why not pay me 200 pounds a month for the next five months or six months or whatever to help reduce that burden on the back end so that you've got more money to buy the property that you really want. Okay. Would that help you? Would that help to ease cash flow issues? Cause I know money's tight for everybody right now. It'll help me. It'll help you. Maybe there's a win-win there. It's an idea to experiment with. Okay. So that's something to look at as a possibility. Obviously your fee structures need to change in terms of you might set a marketing budget up front. So 350, 400, 500 pounds up front as a marketing budget, and then your commission on the back end once you've sold the property, but you're spending that money and investing that money in their marketing of the property. Okay. Then there's things like your technology that you need to employ in order to streamline the process in getting that property through to completion as soon as possible. Again, services like WiggyWam can really help you there because we aim to sit alongside you in the conveyances to increase the transparency and the communication and the collaboration, more importantly, of getting your clients deals done and through to completion as soon as possible. Okay. So hopefully that gives you some kind of guidance. One of the things that again, and I just want to wrap up this point about upfront information is that you guys know the kind of excitement that clients have once they've made that important decision to put their property on the market. Okay. It's a pretty life-changing decision because it's going to affect where they're going to spend potentially the next five, 10, 15 rest of their life years in the next property. Okay. Big decision to make. So once they've made that decision, there's a certain amount of excitement and relief that comes with it. And off the back of that, surely that's the time to be asking your clients to be providing as much upfront information as possible so that you can help them fast track the deal through to completion once the sale's been agreed. Okay. I think that's really important. I think it's well worth doing and hopefully you guys do too, so that you can help them with their move because that's all they want, right? They just want to sell their one property and they want to buy another one. They want to pick up the keys to that new property as soon as possible. And they don't want any of the headaches. So the more headaches you take away from them, the more they're going to be prepared to pay for you to do that. Okay. But they've got to know what those headaches are that they're going to be facing. And if you're not upfront and telling them what those headaches are likely to be, which is what we've tried to do within home buyer secrets. Okay. If you're not upfront and telling them all of that, then they're never going to know. And they're always just going to say so-and-so down the road, will do it for 1% or half a percent. Why don't I just go with them? Okay. So I hope that's answered the question, Jenny. Again, quite a lot of information in there. So I hope I haven't gone off too much at a bit of a tangent there, but maybe watch the video back a couple of times and dig into that a little bit deeper, but hopefully it sparked a few ideas. And look, one of the big things to do is if you're worried about the market and things getting harder and keeping the doors open on your agency, disappear for an afternoon with a notebook and just come up with as many crazy ideas that you can throw at your notebook that's going to solve this problem. And I guarantee there'll be one or two in there that make you sit back and go, do you know what, actually that idea could really work. And then you take action on the idea and implement it into your business and see what happens. Okay. So best of luck with that one, Jenny. Hope it all goes well. And let's move on to question number four. So question number four comes in here from Juliet. Hi there, Juliet. Thank you for being part of the amazing WiggyWam community and submitting your question here. So Juliet says, I found my dream home, but it's listed at a higher price than I can realistically afford, especially now interest rates keep going up. How can I negotiate a better deal to buy it without overextending myself? That's a great question, Juliet. Thank you very much indeed for sending that in. 
Look, there's a couple of answers I can give you to this one, and it depends who you speak to as to what answer you're going to get to this question, Juliet, if I'm honest. Now, if you're talking to somebody who lives and breathes negotiation and all the rest of it, and they're all about the close, and they're all about killing it, and they're all about crushing it, and they're all about winner takes all and all that sort of thing, they're going to tell you to go in really low, okay? And they're going to tell you to negotiate in tiny increments all the way up. So if the property's on the market at, I don't know, 150,000, you go in at a hundred or you go in at 90, okay? And then go up in maybe a thousand, 1500 or even 500 pound increments until you get to the best price that you think they will sell it for. And I'd better be closer to your opening figure than their opening figure. All right. That's what the Coffees for Closers crew will tell you about what it's all about in negotiating with property deals. Look, in your situation, Juliet, you're describing this as your dream home, which means there's already emotional attachment to it. And if I try and tell you to adopt the Coffees for Closers closing technique and go in there and beat them up on price and try and get it for the best deal you possibly can, that's never going to work because you're not going to listen to me. You're not going to take any of my advice on board and you're going to go, screw you, Silas. I'm going to go and buy it and pay what I want for it because I love the house, right? And that's fair because I've seen many people in that exact same situation. So here's the way I'd approach it in your shoes, Juliet. You fell in love with it. You've got an emotional attachment to it. And guess what? The sellers will have an emotional attachment to the property too. And in all my years as working as an estate agent and in all my years of being in property, emotional attachment to property overrides logic. It overrides reason. It overrides any kind of negotiating tactic I can possibly give you. And I'm going to suggest that you go and you sit in front of the sellers and you talk to them and you win them over and you tell them your life story or the proceed version of it. You tell them how much you'd love to live in the property. And you just honest and upfront with them and say, look, this is what's happening in the market right now. When I started looking for a property, I could afford this. Interest rates have gone up this much since I can afford this. I really would love to buy your home. And the best price I can offer you is X, but I'd really love to be the buyer. And I totally understand if you'd want to turn that offer down because it's not what you're asking for. And I want to caveat what I'm saying here, Juliet, for all the estate agents watching this who are going. You're encouraging clients to negotiate direct with the vendors. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is build the emotional connection with the seller. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Because you guys know, as well as I do, that emotional connection will override any advice that you give the clients, especially when they're emotionally connected to their home. I'm sure you've had situations if you've been in the game long enough where you've put a property on the market at a certain figure, somebody's gone round, they've started talking. They've said, yes, this is the exact buyer that we want for this property. And they've sold it for less than what you felt you could get for it being their estate agent. But the deal's already been done. And that deal will never fall apart. It will always go through because you've got two people who are emotionally tied to that property. The one is sad to leave it, but they know it's going to a safe pair of hands, which is the new buyer who's already fell in love with the property and will do anything to live there. Okay, so I don't know whether that <laughs> maybe the negotiating tactic you were looking for, Juliet, but I'm a big believer in this situation. Look, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You go and talk to them. You put your cards on the table. This is it. There's no hokey pokey. There's no smoke and mirrors. It's this. What do you think? But I love the property and I'd love to live here. And if they turn you down, you play the waiting game. Okay, because it may well be that if the price is unrealistic or the market's moving away, then actually they might come back to you in three months time or two months time or a week's time and go, actually, we found a property that we like. We'd love to move to it. We'd love you to be the preferred buyer for the property. We know you're going to take good care of it. We've negotiated a better deal than we thought we could on the one that we're going to buy. Therefore, you're the perfect buyer for it. Okay. So that would be something I'd be definitely prepared to do if I was in your situation. I'd certainly sit on my hands for a couple of weeks or a couple of months just to see whether or not they did actually sell. And here's a final point to reflect on Juliet. And it's not something that is spoken about widely for many reasons, but there may be possibilities that you could explore with the sellers 
around the subject of seller's finance or a gifted deposit or something of that nature with the sellers if they like you enough and they want to do a deal, but they still want to get the price that they need for the transaction. And that's a little bit more complicated. I think I do touch on it in the financing section in Home Buyer Secrets. But if you want more information on that, about how to structure a seller finance deal or how to broach that conversation or what is even involved, then again, just get in contact with me. We'll have that conversation and I'll show you what's involved. And then it's up to you guys whether or not you can make that work on paper between the two of you. All right. So hope that helps, Juliet. I'm really excited for you. It sounds like it could be a really good opportunity and I wish you all the very best of luck. And if there's anything else that we can do here at Wiggy Wham to support you, then please do let me know. Moving on, question number five comes in here from John. Hi there, John. Thank you for being part of the amazing Wiggy Wham community and for submitting your question through to us. So John says, how can I overcome problems with solicitors who don't communicate or provide any updates whatsoever? Okay there, John, thank you for the question. Presuming you're an agent when you're asking that question, or you might even be another solicitor who's involved in conveyancing and you're getting pretty fed up of not getting feedback that you need in that communication about how things are progressing with your property deals. And trust me, it's a question that I get quite often on these webinars or variations of the same sort of thing, if I'm honest. And here's what I want to say to you, John. Look, as an agent, you have a lot of power and a lot of pull, for want of a better word, with your clients and also with the legal professionals that they're working with. And one of the things I see so many times is agents getting fed up or frustrated that clients have said, oh, we're going to use so-and-so solicitors down the road for buying or selling this property. And my take is, why are you not advising your clients to the best possible way that you can to help your clients understand that there are very good solicitors that are worth paying extra money for, and that will get the deal done with the least frustration, the least headaches, the least complications. And there are the other end of the scale who you want to avoid like the plague. Okay. And it, it doesn't take much to put together a list of preferred solicitors. And they don't have to be solicitors you're getting a kickback from, but they can be preferred solicitors because you've worked with them in the past. They've done a really good job you know that they'll work to some kind of service level agreement it says we will at least provide you with an update once a week great i can live with that I can let my clients know that there's going to be a weekly update on the deal right so that is something that you can put in place and take ownership of which is the reason why most people feel out of control with their property deals is because they don't feel like they're in control because there's so much surrendered to all these other third party entities that actually shouldn't be Okay, so what I would be doing is, is being upfront with the solicitors that I'm working with and saying, look, this is at standard service level agreement. Do you agree with it or not? If not, I cannot recommend other clients to come and work with you because it's not worth the risk to my reputation. It's not worth the heartache and the pain and the frustration for my clients who aren't going to get the level of service that they need from you as a solicitor. Now, if you're prepared to sign up to this, we'll work with you. No problems whatsoever. We're happy to guide you as much as we can. We're happy to send you as much business as we can, but this is what we need to agree as the way things are going to be done. Okay. You're in charge, be the boss, if you like, and take ownership of this whole process, but don't expect to hit them with an SLA and then in the same breath or the next sentence say, yeah, but you're going to have to pay us a referral fee of X, Y, and Z, because quite frankly, guys, and this is the thing that I don't think many agents realize is that referral fees are quite frankly, killing a lot of your business. And they're certainly killing your client's customer journey when it comes to working with you. And a lot of agents are going to kick back and say, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Think about it. If you're referring them to solicitors that take 16 weeks, 20 weeks to put a deal through. Okay. What good is that when there's a one in three chance of the deal falling through? And you then end up with your 200, 300 pound referral fee, but your 3000 pound commission or more is at risk of evaporating into thin air. What good is that? Why not get the deal done in a much faster time scale? Okay. As soon as you can get it done in six to eight weeks, bank your commission, move on to the next client, get your testimonial from the client that you've served and you've done a really good job with. 
and then move on to the next client and the next client and foster that loyalty, build that engagement with your community. Okay. And then you've got greater online presence, more reviews, greater reputation. You're banking your cash a lot quicker. Your clients are getting their deals done a lot happier. Your conveyances can now afford to employ good quality staff and more support staff and more technology in the business. And they have to do less caseloads in order to make a profit at the end of the year. I'm sitting here going, what's so difficult to work out here? But if you're focused on this, I'm going to claim my 200, 300 pound referral fee, it's a hiding to nowhere. It's probably, in my opinion, the worst thing agents can be doing to their clients in sacrificing them for this little bit of extra jam in the property deal. Okay. Forget that. Focus your efforts on winning more of the 3,000 pounds and the 5,000 pound commissions. And if you're not getting that three to 5,000 pound commission, ask yourself why, what do you need to do to get to that level? Okay. To help your clients sell and claw those fees into your business as soon as possible. Okay. Now there are online tools that you can use to increase communication and collaboration and document exchange between different people, particularly solicitors. But one of the key things that I keep coming back to, and I've probably mentioned it to, I'm blue in the face now on this webinar already, but if you've got that seller pack prepared up front and early on, you take that seller's pack and you give it to the solicitor. So they've got a really good head start on actually getting the contracts out there, raising any inquiries on what's going on, and potentially they've even got the searches in place ready to go. Now that's a pretty good pack of information to start off with, right? Rather than just having, then sending a letter out to their client saying, we need to see your ID and we need a couple hundred quid on account before we can get started. You're already six weeks ahead of the average just by putting that in place. So that's how I view it. That's how we've set up WiggyWam to set up that streamline and transparency and communication, but also to work with amazing third parties in the marketplace like Pitfault, Veya, who are coming into the marketplace and with the intention to speed up property transactions. What could be better than that? Okay. These are not people that are talking about doing something. These are people like us who have invested significant amounts of their own money, their own resources, their own time and education to deliver these products to the marketplace. And if you ask me, that's absolutely priceless because those are the people you want to be listening to, not the old guard who've not been in agency for 30 odd years. And they're sitting there going, this is the way things are done now. It's not, the world is changing so rapidly, so quickly. And if we're not moving with it, AI, hello, is around the corner, is going to eat our lunch for us. And we're going to be left wondering what on earth went on. Okay. So those are the sorts of things that we are really championing at the bit for, to help people as much as possible to have an enjoyable moving experience and remove the frustration, remove the burden, remove the workload from solicitors as much as agents. Why wouldn't a solicitor use a platform where they can click a button and it lets everybody know what's going on and they don't even have to pick up the phone and have to type a lengthy email. They don't have to do any of that. Click a button. Okay. Job done. Everybody's updated onto the next one. Oh, I can click another button for that one as well. Everybody's updated. Okay. Onto the next one. So that 70 case files is 70 clicks of a button. That's my Monday morning done. What am I going to do for the rest of the week? I know I've now got time to work on all of my property files. How amazing is that? And, and I know you think I'm being facetious guys, but it's there. It's already there. But if you're not using it in your business, you're going to still have to deal with the 70 phone calls a week before you even get any work done. Well, actually it's 420 calls a week, isn't it? It's six phone calls per case file. You've got 70 case files. It's 420 phone calls a week or 70 clicks of the button on a Monday morning to provide people with updates. I don't know. To me, it seems like a tough choice to make. So look guys, I'm pulling your legs. Hopefully you can see I'm having a little bit of fun today. If you're not on WiggyWam, get on it. Okay. There's absolutely no reason why conveyances and estate agents are not using this platform to fast track their transactions. John, hope that helps. Excuse my long rambling reply today, but yeah, the sun's definitely gone to my head a little bit today and I'm enjoying it. So you'll have to forgive me. So question number six comes in here from Ashley. Hi there, Ashley. Thank you for being part of the amazing WiggyWam community. So Ashley's question is, how can I gain more of a market share in a competitive industry like a state agency? Thank you, Ashley. That's a really good question. And I'm going to kick back with you first of all, and ask you, 
what is it that you think having a greater market share is going to solve in your business? Okay. Because there is this real misunderstanding that having more market share is going to give you what you really want. And quite frankly, often the opposite is true. And that doesn't mean to have no market share. That means to have less market share, but to be more profitable. Okay. So how would having more market share actually help you reach your goals? And the answer for most people is that it actually probably wouldn't. Yes, they have the ego metric, okay, of having the greatest market share in the area, but then does that mean anything if it doesn't translate to pounds, shillings, and pence? And to give you a very classic example, which you will be aware of being in the industry, is that Purple Bricks had a massive market share, okay, at one point. But what happened? It wasn't profitable, and the company ultimately has gone to the wall. So you have to really think deeper than this kind of surface level metric of being the biggest in your area. I'd rather be the most profitable, frankly. And if that meant that I did a 10th of the deals that the biggest estate agent in area we did, and they had more boards around, but I did a 10th of their deals, but I was more profitable than them, even though they did so many more deals than I did, then good luck to them. Let them burn all that energy off and let me concentrate on delivering the customer excellence that I know that I can deliver to my clients and they can feel great value in the exchange between the service I give them and the money they pay for my commission. Okay. So that's where I'd start by answering your question, Ashley, is to look at what is it you're actually trying to achieve rather than just going with this headline metric of largest market share in your area. Okay. Then I would look at. Once you've set that real goal, the goal that's lying underneath that, which is, I want to be more profitable. I want to be well-liked. I want to increase my conversion rates so that I can ultimately become more profitable, whatever it might be. You then need to look at the different rate shaping factors that will set you apart from your competition. And very often in a local area, there are not many differentiating factors between one estate agent and the next. And that sounds like a horrible thing to say. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't make the rules. Unfortunately, if you go into any town or city around the country, and I've done it myself, I've been there, you go in and you start talking to the estate agents. How do you help sell properties? Oh, we do this and this. Or we put a board up. Okay. Doesn't everybody put a board up? We do a company viewings. Okay. Doesn't everybody do a company viewings? Oh, we put it on the portals. So does every agent have access to the portals? Okay. So we open longer hours. Okay, 24-7 email, online accessibility, is that really a major selling point? And the point of me mentioning all of this, actually, is that these value propositions that you need to bring to the marketplace that you're serving is far beyond what everybody else is offering. And the challenge, and I've said this in previous episodes before, Ashley, but the real challenge is confronting yourself and saying, I'm going to do something very different to what everybody else is doing. And unfortunately, the way human beings have evolved is that the safety in numbers and the safety in doing the same as what everybody else is doing. And it's very scary when we start to move away from the herd and we start to do things on our own. We start to do things in our own unique way because that's deemed as risky. Okay. But the only people that make breakthroughs in an industry are the people that are prepared to do something a little bit risky. Okay. So if you want your 2% fees, and if you want to have the best online reviews and all the rest of it, then you've got to deliver something different to your marketplace that nobody else is offering. And that might be something as simple as sellers packs and upfront information. Okay. It might be that you're the only office in your area that's selling home buyer secrets to your audience, because you recognize the value that something like this would bring to buyers and sellers in your area. Okay. That might be something as simple as writing your own book and putting that in front of everybody as a lead magnet for your business. Okay. There's a million things that you could be doing here, but it's going to take some time to sit down and think it through and decide actually, what is it you want to do? And what do you want to deliver to your clients as a way of giving them excellence in terms of customer service. So those are a couple of ideas that I would run with Ashley. One of the most powerful things that you can do as well to build into your business is to create incredible relationships 
with other people in your local area that can refer you work because there's nothing more powerful than being referred to somebody which carries a kind of prestige. So if you're working with a trusted provider, say a landscape gardener, and he's talking to the owners and they're saying, do you know what? We're thinking about maybe selling our home. Oh, do you know what? Go and speak to Ashley, the estate agent down the road. He's a really good mate of mine. He's a good lad. I know him. I've known him for a number of years. He's definitely going to help you to get the best price for your home. All words to that effect. Okay. Those are the sorts of relationships that you want to start to try and cultivate in order to win the business that you want to win. Okay. So I would definitely work on creating and enhancing and building those relationships over time. And that comes from a referral exchange, obviously. If your landscape gardener is referring your work, you want to refer him work as well, of course. And then the biggest thing that underpins all of this is just servicing your client in a way that nobody else can. All right. And as I've already touched on, so many other agents offer the same perceived level of service. You want to be the one that's offering the most excellent level of service. And one of the best ways you can do that, Ashley, if you ask me, is to increase the length of the client nurturing journey with you before you are ever asked to go out and look at their property. Okay. Now, what did I just say in all of that? Again, if you read Estate Agent Secrets, I set it all out here as to what you need to do in order to create that customer nurturing journey. For your client. But if you think about it, moving home is a very big decision to make. And people are thinking about making that move three, six, 12, 18 months before they actually do decide to put the property on the market. When they've had children, sometimes they're thinking years ahead. Okay. Now, what would it take for you to be the agent that once a week, once a month, sends them an email, sends them an update, sends them a birthday card, sends them a Christmas card, send them a, a weekly e-zine or whatever else it might be. If e is even a thing nowadays, I don't know. But you're sending them some kind of information that keeps you top of mind for when it comes to sell their property. And it's more important, again, to employ this to everybody that you sell a property to. You definitely need to be employing this in your business, okay, so that you can educate them share and nurture them through this entire process. They might be in that property for five years, but what if every month they've had something off you over five years, that's 60 communications before they even think about putting the house on the market. Who's going to be their go-to estate agent at that point? But who else is doing that? Not many people. And with the technology that we've got available nowadays, guys, there really is no excuse. So. I've gone into quite a bit of detail there, Ashley. If you want more information, shoot me an email. Happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. That's happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. And I'd be delighted to go through that with you. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of today's webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. As I say, I think the, uh, the thumbs definitely had an impact in terms of some of the answers I've given to these questions today, but I hope you'll appreciate I've given all of my answers with the best possible intent as I can and to try and make this as entertaining as I can but also as self-explanatory as I can to really help you see the opportunity that is unfolding in the marketplace right now. We're here as WiggyWam every week doing these to try and help and support the industry as much as possible and to help you make the changes that you need in your business because times are rapidly changing. And if you're not moving with them, I cannot stress enough, it's going to get very tough and very difficult and far harder to weather the storm than it ever has been. So. Please heed my guidance. Please heed my advice. Reach out if you want some support. If you want to talk to me, if you want a copy of any of our books, come and talk to me. You can get in touch with us. You can send us your property questions, anything like that. Send us an email, happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. That's happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. You can go to our Twitter. You can go to our Instagram. You can even go to our TikTok channel now. And that is all at wiggywam underscore UK. That's at wiggywam underscore UK. You can even go to our website, which is wiggywam.co.uk. You can register for a free account on there, or you can sign up to become one of our clients on that site. We can engage on that platform as well. You can ask any questions that you like through there. You're going to find more learning resources on that site that's going to help and guide you as much as possible. And I'm just here to offer you as much as I possibly can of me. I'm here to serve. I'm here to welcome you to a better way of doing things. And whatever it is that you need, please reach out. It'd be my delight to support you through this journey. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on a webinar again in the future very soon.
So thanks ever so much indeed for joining me, guys. And look forward to catching up with you very soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye.